What's up, gangsters? Let's take a look at some more Section 3 video nasties. And, well, <laughs> I, I really can't be explaining what all that means every few years that I, you know, finally decide to pick up this series again. So, just check out the beginning of the first video in the series for some more context. All you really need to know for now is that it's it's basically just an excuse for myself to take a look at some shitty 70s and 80s horror and exploitation movies. Although in all honesty, today's video, not even that shitty movies. Except for maybe the last one, and well, the first one. Final Exam. Funny little side note, it's not really funny, but... I actually started working on this video some three years ago, I just never actually made the video. But it didn't mean that n now that I actually decided to just like pick it up and like finish the video, I did re-watch all of the movies again and I just do not think that this one is that great. But you know, let's, let's, just, uh, let's just take a look. I always thought of this one as being part of the early 80s slasher cycle. You know, just a good old fashioned slasher flick. But it also kinda isn't. See, we mostly just follow a bunch of college kids and their typical college activities. You know, like studying, boy trouble, trying to get into a fraternity, creepy old teachers banging students, and school shootings. You know, the usual. With the, <laughs> with, with the letter, in my opinion, absolutely being the movie's standout scene, for better or worse. See, at some point this van drives up the college campus, filled with masked perpetrators who come out blasting, gunning down a bunch of students. But it was just a prank, bro. Just a good old classic fraternity prank. You know, the one where you pretend to murder a bunch of people on a crowded college campus. It's hilarious. <laughs> oh man, I, I just cannot get over this scene. Like, who did... It definitely did not age well. But, so yeah, classic college shenanigans. Honestly, if it wasn't for the as by the books as possible opening scene where these two horny college students, oh, well, mostly one, but this guy really wants to bang her, are, are making out in their car in a remote, isolated location only to be killed, you wouldn't even be able to tell that this is a slasher flick at all. Mostly just a somewhat dull college comedy? Just not a very funny one. Although, <laughs> I do like that their initial reaction to that first kill was the fact that now they might be able to take on their football team. You know, since they killed like one of the good players, I guess? But still, during my initial viewing of this movie a couple of years ago, I mostly just wrote down in my notes how uninteresting this was. I just do not care for the characters. I absolutely hated the stereotypical jock character. This looks like a job for Stop it! And I, I don't get how this lame ass dude is like the head of the fraternity. I hate his fucking hair. The nerdy kid is okay, he has some cool horror movie posters in his room. And then there's the, the final girl, the plainest of girls next door. Uh, mm, yeah, I, I do not know any of their names. Except for Radish here, because what the fuck kind of name is that? Anyway, so what is this movie about? Throughout we see this guy driving his van around or just standing there, like nothing's happening. You're about an hour in before he starts killing, again, <laughs> although by now you've long forgotten the opening scene, and by this time you also just do not really care anymore. Turns out he's just some guy with terrible hair as well, completely forgettable killer. Okay, yeah, he catches this crossbow arrow midair, which is pretty badass. But yeah, and then the movie just sort of ends. It's just not very great. Especially not if you approach it as a slasher flick. I mean, there's a, a low body count, it's not very gory, there's like one second of nudity. But Maybe therein lies my problem, you know, maybe I shouldn't approach it as a slasher flick, as silly as that might sound. But I, I say this because online I did see quite some reviews of people saying that they enjoyed this movie for its portrayal of like North Carolina, small town college life, maybe? Then again, I'm not American and I, I just do not get this whole fraternity pledge culture, I mean it, 
It looks fucking awful to me. I mean, I don't want some creepy old college guard pouring whiskey down my underpants in the middle of the night while I'm tied up to a tree. But hey, what do I know? I mean, I'm just some silly European boy that still lived with his parents when I went through college. So, um, let's just leave it at that and, um, well, let's, let's move on to the next one. It's, uh, it's time for some good old exploitation with Foxy Brown. You know what? Let's just jump into it. Written and directed by exploitation legend Jack Hill, who significantly contributed to subgenres such as the uh, Women in Prison movie and black exploitation, with titles like Coffee and, well, of course, Foxy Brown. This movie is actually rather story heavy, but at its core, it's a crime story involving a drug ring and Pam Greer's Foxy Brown trying to get revenge for the murder of her boyfriend through vigilante justice. And that's cool. Foxy is mostly just minding her own business until she gets involved with, you know, like the aforementioned drug ring through her brother and boyfriend and then shows everybody that she is a total fucking badass. She's the absolute star of the show. And she's a whole lot of woman. You know it. I love the 70s, like, disco aesthetics throughout this movie. Foxy is rocking some awesome outfits. And, of course, we get a bunch of funky tunes. Oh, baby. Even though it's now considered a black exploitation classic, it could be criticized for its negative portrayal of black communities, you know, like overrun with drugs and violence. And I'm in no real position or even able to really say anything about this, but still got it. <laughs> I've mostly always just seen Foxy Brown's character, at least, as a female empowering heroine. She's strong, independent, doesn't quit, but she's also nurturing and looking out for her community. And again, just a total fucking badass. Is she being sexualized here? Sure, but it's, um, <laughs> okay, yeah, I, I don't really have a point. Can't even really make a point here. I mean, this is still 70s exploitation, after all. But she's awesome. And there's just nothing like some sweet vigilante justice. And oh my god, do we get some satisfying vengeance towards the end. Death is too easy for you, bitch. I want you to suffer. Honestly, there's not much more to say about this one. At least not in a way that I can make this video more funny. Jack Hill regular Sid Hagues makes an appearance towards the end. Hi, he's charming and sleazy as always. They're pretty liberal with the N and F words. We're gonna kill ourselves a couple of niggas. Like I said, it's a prison from your faggot boyfriend. But that's not very funny. If anything, it's actually super bad. <laughs> so mad that, that did not work at all. So, uh, yeah, maybe I'll just leave it at that. Yeah, and that's fine. It's it's a fun movie, guys. Check it out. During my uh, initial notes that I wrote for this movie a few years back when I first started working on this video, I wrote that I hadn't yet seen Coffee, but will do so soon. And now, um, while rewatching Foxy Brown for this, you know, like for me to actually make this video, I wrote down the exact same thing. I do actually have the, uh, the Arrow video Blu-ray release for both movies, so um, feel free to check in in three years to see if I finally actually did. But um, until then, uh, it's time for our next movie. Because, uh, oh wow, it's, it's a bit of a double feature. See, as much as I describe this series as an excuse for myself to take a look at some shitty horror movies, we are gonna run into some classics along the way. Enter Friday the 13th. Um, maybe not necessarily a good movie, but um, a classic nonetheless. So um, let's take a look at that. Friday the 13th. Ah, what a classic. Mostly everything there is to say about this one already has been said, so let's just have some fun with it. Personally, it's it's a bit of a comfort movie, and re-watching it again before I started working on this video, it, it kind of made me, you know, like, sort of rediscover my love for the slasher genre. I did a video on this movie at the very, very early days on my channel, some 15 years ago, where I say this. Daar wil ik het nou niet zozeer over hebben, ik maak wel een keer een aparte slasher video, nee. And, well, so 15 years later, I, I still haven't, but 
yeah, I'd, I'd still love to do that one day. And then, not just about the early 80s slasher flicks themselves, but also the, the, the whole history. It's, it's so fascinating to me. L like, do we just start with Halloween and Friday the 13th? Or are we gonna go back to the likes of Black Christmas and the Texas Chainsaw Massacre? Can't forget about the Italian Jalo flicks. I mean, gotta mention a Bay of Blood or Blood and Black Lace. But then we're already in the in the 1960s, so why not go back to the likes of Blood Feast and Peeping Tom and, well, of course, the granddaddy of modern horror, Psycho. But um, so, sorry, I'm I'm losing focus here. And as undoubtedly influential Halloween is, I've always been Team Friday the 13th. The movie added the isolated location, gory killings, nudity. Oh, wait, it, is there nudity in this movie? Nice. It, it really just fine-tuned the blueprint for what became the slasher flick that dominated the horror genre in the early 80s. And while Halloween might objectively be the better movie, Friday is just so much fun. And I feel like the genre really needed this movie. And to me, it's the, the ultimate prototype of the classic 80s slasher. Perhaps a case of right place, right time, but still, here we are. It's so funny to me always like, how this movie is so connected to the hockey mask wearing, machete wielding Jason Voorhees. I mean, understandably so, even though, spoiler alert, he's not the killer in this movie. It's actually, it's kind of crazy to think that it wasn't until the second sequel that we're introduced to the infamous hockey mask. Still, the, the original is, come on guys, it's fun. You've got Cookie Ralph, who at some point just randomly waits inside his pantry. That that's always funny to me. A young Kevin Bacon, some cool, memorable gore effects by the great Tom Savini. Although I, I do always hate the delayed, like weird editing during this specific that scene. Some animal cruelty that I always forget is in here. It's like, it's so misplaced. Strip Monopoly, which is such a random thing to do in general, let alone with people you've just met. Like, Strip Monopoly? That does not exist. The, the iconic soundtrack by Harry Manfredini. Very psycho-esque at times. But still quite memorable and so effective. Mrs. Voorhees slapping the shit out of the final girl that's that's so fucking funny. And then later, Tom Savini's hands standing in for Betsy Palmer during her death scene. So good. And of course, the classic final scare. So good. But honestly, they should have just cut to the end credit right after this. Like, that's such a missed opportunity. Really, at, at this point, you, you don't really care about the little police procedural. It, it should have just been like this. Anyway, um... <laughs> That's Friday the 13th. Like I said, there really isn't that much to say about this one that hasn't been said multiple times over already. And perhaps the whole, you know, like, legacy surrounding this movie makes it better than it actually is. But, I don't know, I, I've always just um, sincerely enjoyed this one. Uh, also, remember this? Because, uh, oh wow, it's, it's a bit of a double feature. Yeah, so... Friday the 13th Part 2 is also on this list. And, well, uh, speaking of this list, I, I really only just now realize that, well, especially with my uh, original Video Nazi series, I would usually be with every movie like, oh, you know, like it's probably on the list because of so-and-so reasons. But at this point, I'm, I'm mostly just like, who the hell knows what they were thinking back in the 80s when they seemingly like so randomly rushed out these lists that I'm like, Let's just talk about the movies. So, um, yeah, um, Friday the 13th Part 2. So, here we have the first in a seemingly endless stream of Friday the 13th sequels. And also where the whole timeline starts to become kinda muddy. See, after the 
pretty elaborate prologue here in which Alice, the, the original final girl, finds Mrs. Voorhees' head in her fridge and then gets killed by Jason. Which, don't you just hate it when that happens? It, it, it's now five years later, technically setting this movie in the future. <laughs> I love how Ralph is still rocking the exact same outfit some five years later. I mean, some drip just doesn't go out of style. Also, while the original Friday the 13th is set in the present, which you'd presume is 1980, since, you know, that's the year the movie was released, in part 4 we see Mrs. Voorhees' tombstone saying that she died in 79, which would set the original in 79, which seems to be a, a widely accepted timeline. But there was no Friday, June 13 in 79. So yeah, the timeline is a little muddy. Anyway, this guy sets up camp around Crystal Lake to train camp counselors, which is the bare minimum required to justify a now fully grown Jason Voorhees to slaughter up a bunch of would-be camp counselors. The whole Jason story really does not make a whole lot of sense if you think about it for longer than a second. But like, where has he been this whole time? Then again, this franchise has never been hailed for its intricate writing, so it's best to just accept that a mentally disabled man has been living in the woods by himself for the past 20-something years and waited some five years after the death of his mother to take vengeance. And well, vengeance he takes. With some pretty cool kills. Including the one famously borrowed from Mario Bava's A Bay of Blood. It does also become painfully apparent that some cuts had to be made for this movie to receive an R rating, which obviously is a bit of a shame. But a few years ago, the for some 40 years believed to be lost cut footage magically resurfaced and made it onto the Scream Factory Blu-ray release and it's pretty awesome to see how this movie could have been. Or well, should have been. I mean, it, these are some pretty cool gore scenes. Besides that, there really isn't that much to say about this one, as it's, it's a fairly standard slasher flick. I mean, <laughs> in all honesty, so is the original, but at least that one was like the first one to do it. And I, I do definitely prefer the original one over this first sequel. The kills are just a little less memorable and I don't know. Sure, there's some enjoyable stuff, like the, the classic campfire scary story time, including scary prank. I mean, it's not as memorable as the school shooting prank, but hey, they do like fake scares here in this movie. The cat at the beginning, the dog at the end. And I always enjoy the confused look on the cop's face after he discovers Jason's shack. And I mean, this is the first time that we properly get to see Jason in action. Look at him, all silly with a bag over his head. <laughs> Imagine if this was a Jason throughout the whole franchise. Ooh, will, will we get a face reveal? Oh. Jesus. No, it's Jason. So, yeah, uh, no face reveal. Oh! Ah, another classic final scare. So, yeah. And as you probably know, there's about a billion sequels after this one. Um, maybe one day I'll make a, like a, like a franchise video about the, the whole franchise where I talk about all of them. But then again, I also feel like that's kind of been done already. So maybe I won't. Anyway, um, after all that, it's, well, it's, it's already time for our, uh, for the last video in today's movie. Uh, let's try that one again. So, after all of that, it's, well, it's, it's already time for the last movie in today's video. And it's, well, it's without a doubt the least known? GBH. Which, of course, stands for Grievous Bodily Harm. Whoa. I mean, if that doesn't sound like a gruesome, brutal horror movie to you, you're, you're actually right. <laughs> because... This is something completely different. Besides a mystery as to why this particular movie out of all of them ended up on this list, it's probably best described as a no-budget, misguided passion project. And, um, well, I do love those. And honestly, 
I might have to give it a little more credit than just that, as the whole story behind this movie is actually rather fascinating. At the center of this all we have Manchester legend Cliff Twemlow, a nightclub bouncer turned one-man filmmaking army with in the case of GBH, is taken on the role of writer, producer, composer, and star. Between the early 80s and early 90s, he kinda created a mini filmmaking empire in the Manchester area, pumping out a handful of ambitious action flicks, with, again, GBH arguably being his best-known work. So, what do we have here? Well, Twemlo stars as Steve the Mancunian Donovan, a nightclub bouncer, <laughs> believe it or not, who, fresh out of jail, is offered a job at the zoo to protect it from a ruthless mob that's been terrorizing the nightclubs in the Manchester area. And that's literally the whole movie. Really, even at only some 70 minutes, this still feels rather tedious. There's just not a whole lot of story, so <laughs> you better get used to shots of nightclubbing, which there is a whole lot of. It also, as you can probably tell by now, the quality, it's not that great. The movie is shot on video and here we have to work with a VHS rip, which in combination with the accents, sometimes makes it a little hard for me to follow. Your daughter just took sick. It's starting to be a new geezer on her door, do you understand what I'm talking about? What? What are they saying? Then again, when we do clearly get to hear what they're saying, we aren't exactly treated to the most compelling of dialogue. How about this then? Looks like Stonehenge. <laughs> Wait till you see inside. Don't tell me. It's got a fountain with fairies. <laughs> no fairies, but it has got a fountain. This I gotta see. How riveting. What I do enjoy a lot about this movie is its, you know, like its vanity project aspect. In the tradition of titles like Road to Vengeance and Fatal Deviation, and later the works of Tommy Wiseau and Neil Breen, Twemlow wrote himself as this, this irresistible, womanizing, sophisticated badass. Well, for Christ's sakes, I mean, leave some for me. I would wish I just always love when they do that. When he isn't forcefully, question mark, showing girls half his age that he still has it going on, he's romanticizing his melancholic solitude, all the while beating up a bunch of goons. He's definitely a bit of a renaissance man, although in this particular case, he's the Mancunian man. And to be fair, some of it does seem to be played somewhat tongue-in-cheek, and honestly, it it is all rather charming and wholesome. It's just the movie is just not that great. The title and VHS cover art grossly oversell its violence aspect, as it's actually rather tame. We mostly just get a handful of <laughs> somewhat clumsily choreographed fight scenes. Besides that, there's a way too big emphasis on its love story subplot, which is neither interesting nor very well written. And then you're left with, again, just not that great of a movie. Interesting story behind it though, like I said. So interesting, in fact, that he is now getting his own Severin Films produced documentary that'll premiere later this month. How about that fucking timing? And honestly, it looks like a blast. Hopefully it'll be released alongside the uh, rumored GBH Blu-ray release. But until then, the movie itself... Mm, It's not great. And like I said, the whole um, story surrounding this movie, if you will, is arguably more interesting than the movie itself. So if that sounds interesting to you, just read into it a little more. I mean, it's, it's kind of hard to recommend this one. I mean, sure, it, it has its charm. It's just, it's just not very good now, is it? And um, well, that actually brings us to the end of this video. I had a lot of fun picking up this series again, and now looking at the you know like the remaining titles that are on these list for upcoming videos, I'm I'm actually excited to just like you know like continue working on this series. But um, per perhaps more importantly, so what do you guys think? Did you have fun with this video? 
please feel free to let me know so that I know if I should, you know, like prioritize this series um, a little more for in the future. So uh, um, you guys go ahead and do that. And um, well, until then, I will see you all in the next video. Cheers. Have a nice day.